Welcome back to my look at the horror classics of yesteryear. From here on out, things start to get a little bit gruesome. We start with the surprisingly gory, but also fairly compelling, Giant Leeches. It takes place in either Louisiana or somewhere along the Gulf Coast. Either way, it's in some sort of swampland where an out-of-towner is the local game warden trying to fend off poachers. Unfortunately, one of the poachers finds something not normal. A creature created out of radiation from nearby Canaveral that uh, seems to have mutated some of the local leeches into human-sized creatures that are more like Lovecraftian horrors. First, they go after the poacher that uh, attacked them at the beginning of the film. Then, after a local woman and her boyfriend are chased into the swamp by the woman's husband, who's also the uh, owner of the local stop and save, Um, and he gets blamed for them getting carried off by the leeches. Which causes him to uh, off himself out of grief. Meanwhile, the uh, game warden's girlfriend's dad decides that the only way to uh, locate the two lovers, the uh, poacher and two guys who went looking for the bodies who also got carried off <clears throat> is to use dynamite. Well, this works getting some of the bodies out. They were barely alive, slowly being fed on by the leeches in a pretty gruesome scene. Only they didn't manage to uh, survive the trip to the surface out of the underwater cave where the leeches have been keeping them. Um, but they do get the bodies out. And the examination proves that this was not a boating accident. They were leeches. Uh... Meanwhile, the game warden suspects that the uh, woman might still be down there, so she or he uh, um, arranges for a dive team to go looking for whatever is down there. Uh, ultimately, finding and spear gunning the leeches to drive them away long enough for the woman to crawl out of the cavern, but again drown before she has a chance to uh, get to safety. And with all the bodies recovered, they drop an even bigger charge in the water and kill the leeches once and for all. Or do they? Because some of the leeches look like they might be still twitching. Next is The Screaming Skull. It's about a guy who lost his wife due to a tragic accident. Um, she slipped in the rain, hit her head on a rock wall, and drowned in a, in a pond. only for him to find a new woman who had lost her parents when she was young, so she spent a long time in an asylum dealing with the stress. So he marries her, brings her home, 
Only, um, as they're fixing up the place, she starts seeing things. Hearing screams that are somewhat demonic. Seeing a skull in places where it shouldn't be. And... He quickly is revealed to be very unscrupulous, gaslighting her whenever she tries to confide in him, and confide in the local pastor and his wife, who were their next-door neighbors. <clears throat> and... Um, it's revealed that he may have killed his wife and is trying to drive his new wife insane so he can be made her executor because her parents, when they died, left her quite a bit of money. <sighs> yep, it's another evil scheme to get money. Pathetic. Only it's possible that the uh, apparitions, which take the form of the titular Screaming Skulls, might be more real than he thought, as Screaming Skulls actually chase him through the grounds and attack him, sending him into the fish pond, <clears throat> thus saving her. And she gets taken in by the pastor and his wife because they were decent people. Meanwhile, the uh, simple-minded groundskeeper who has been cropping up here and there as a sort of pawn, but not directly responsible for any deaths, is now free to commune with the spirit of the dead woman. Were the skulls real? Were they fake? We don't know. Also, this was one of those films that had a gimmick. A guarantee that uh, anyone who died watching this movie from Fright would get a free burial. Yeah, it was one of those kinds of things. And I think at some point in the theaters at the time of this film's first airing, um, they would have... Uh, fake skeletons rigged up in the rafters of the theater, or maybe people dressed up as skeletons to sort of heighten the atmosphere. Unfortunately, they don't do things like this nowadays, except in, like, 4D experiences, which are interesting. Next, we encounter the Beast of Yucca Flats. It starts with this Russian guy, who's also named Joseph, so I immediately relate to him, especially because he's husky. <laughs> um, he escaped the Iron Curtain after the death of his family, and is delivering Russian secrets to the Americans. Only a couple of Russian agents have been tasked with killing him before he can deliver a briefcase full of secrets. Um, and stopping uh, this other Joseph from using his knowledge to help the Americans. Kind of like how Von Braun helped the Americans after World War II. Um, unfortunately, he's chased into a nuclear testing range and is exposed to a massive dose of radiation once a nuclear test happens. Um, this damages his brain to the point where he's little more than an animal. He kills a woman after she's finished taking a shower in a very risque opening. We see almost everything. Then he kills um, 
a young man who broke down on the side of the road and chokes his girlfriend into unconsciousness and carries her off to a cave. <clears throat> um, and while the authorities find uh, her, she dies of her injuries before they can get her to safety. Then, while um, a couple of investigators try and find the creature responsible and mistake uh, a local guy for the creature, shooting at him from an airplane, um, they ultimately encounter the former scientist turned monster. And while the monster puts up a heck of a fight, he's eventually brought down before he can menace two kids who walked away from their parents while they were getting some gas earlier in the film. But is the beast dead? Because we see him move a little bit before the end of the film. Next, we encounter the Terror. Um, so apparently, Karloff, Boris Karloff, um, did some uh, filming for another movie, but wasn't scheduled to leave for a while. <clears throat> So, the producers decided to just film some extra stuff and make a movie around it, which is awesome. Um, so, this movie involves a baron who is apparently hearing the voice of his dead wife, which is a little awkward because... He killed his wife after finding her with another guy. And now he uh, feels like he's trying to pay a penance. <clears throat> At least before he dies so he can be with her. Um... Meanwhile, a young corporal in the French army, played by Jack Nicholson, holy heck. This was way back before uh, older Jack Nicholson played the Joker. This was uh, one of his big three. The other two being Little Shop of Horrors and Easy Rider, where he got high for the first time. Um... Literally, he actually got high in the movie. <laughs> Not this movie, mind you. <clears throat> um, so the corporal, he meets this woman who leads him to water so he can drink, <clears throat> then disappears. <clears throat> then he encounters an old woman and her assistant, Who tell him that there is no girl. <laughs> then he goes up to the castle to try and investigate, and he meets Karloff's character, who's cordial at first, though when he starts to get a little nosy, he has a servant played by Richard Miller, yeah, the guy from Gremlins and so many other uh, horror and sci-fi and fantasy programs that this guy is a living, well, was a living legend. Um, he tries to 
have the guy escort him out of the castle. And, oh, by the way, this whole thing takes place in 1806. So there's a pair of Remington rolling block single shot pistols and a, a 38 rimfire revolver featured prominently, though we don't really see any gunplay. But it was interesting to see whether or not those were anachronistic. Anywho. Now, I thought um, what happened was um, Karloff's character's wife died giving birth to a daughter, who 20 years later is being used through hypnosis to do stuff. But I was way off. See, it turns out the old woman was using uh, pseudo-witchcraft and had made sort certain uh, deals with the devil to avenge the death of her son, who was the dead wife's lover. <laughs> so she picked a girl who kind of looked like the dead wife and um, used hypnosis to manipulate the old man. The plan is to uh, have him flood the crypt where the wife lays entombed, lies entombed, and basically commit suicide by drowning, which would condemn his soul the way he condemned her soul through murder. <clears throat> um, However, the twist, which is revealed before the old woman gets struck by lightning and immolated for almost being dragged into a chapel, which was a big no-no, apparently. Um, <clears throat> it's revealed that while the Baron did kill his wife, the lover managed to kill the Baron and then had some sort of uh, disassociative identity moment so he thinks he's the Baron when really he's the old woman's son but it's too late as the uh, girl gets him into the tomb and he floods the place and she starts wrestling with him after he sees what's left of his real wife and snaps out of it and the uh, butler in vain tries to get them out and the only one who manages to save anyone is the corporal who saves the girl thinking they can live happily ever after, only after he kisses her, she inexplicably melts into bones. Yeah. And finally, we come to yet another zombie flick. Revolt of the Zombies. <clears throat> this starts in World War I, I believe. And the Allied powers have been offered a gift an Asian mystic supposedly has discovered the ancient uh, secrets of the kings of Angkor Wat <clears throat> on how to turn people into zombies inexhaustible builders who built Angkor Wat, apparently, and in, in, in indestructible soldiers who would be an asset on the battlefield. And he shows just how useful they could be by having um, some zombified Asian troops annihilate 
a trench full of Germans. Only the Allies are a wee bit terrified of what this guy can do. And since he won't reveal how he did it, instead of taking him on as an ally, they keep him prisoner. Morons. Unfortunately, the uh, Middle Eastern delegate, who's a real snake in the grass, decides to kill the mystic and steal a document that he had, which apparently is useful for uh, turning people into zombies, only it wasn't. Instead, during, ex during an expedition to Angkor Wat, a meek fella um, by the name of uh, of well let's just call him Mouse Guy <clears throat> who pines for um, the girlfriend of his friend whom I'm calling Mr. Hero Unfortunately, Mr. Hero gives him some bad advice. If you want something, don't let anyone or anything stand in your way. Just take it. So, Mr. Mouse Guy um, travels to Angkor Wat after everyone else had left because they couldn't find the uh, um, documents or carvings or whatever, <clears throat> but Mouse Guy realized there was a clue somewhere in Angkor Wat. And he comes across a group of mystics venerating the uh, the document that was copied by the uh, first mystic um, <clears throat> and ultimately discovers a carving and translate it, translates it because he's the only one who can translate stuff and discovers the, the secret of Asian zombie powder not to be confused with Haitian zombie powder unfortunately when he returns to the expedition his boss is upset that he's been gone two days and fires him without listening to what he has to say, which ticks him off and drives him insane. Well, he decides if they don't want to hear what I have to say, then I'll use the power for evil. So he uh, turns the entire army of Asian soldiers into zombies. He turns his superiors into zombies. And the father of his friend's girlfriend gets zombified. He even turns the friend into a zombie. But, unbe but unbeknownst to the girlfriend, who willingly gives herself over to marriage of the mouse guy, who's been pining for her this whole time. Well, um... Wouldn't you know it, she manipulates him to, uh, give up his power. And it reminds him of the story of how the king of Angkor Wat lost his power. He fell for some femme fatale who convinced him to give up his power, and as soon as he did, those under his control rose up in rebellion and tore him apart. Right about that time, the army comes bursting in, destroys the lab where the zombie powder was created, and shoots Mouse Guy down. And so, Hero 
and hero guy, and the girlfriend live happily ever after. Oh, and fun fact: the uh, creepy eyes from the ghosty uh, in White Zombie were used for some of the scenes where the guy controls the people in zombie form. So that's the callback to White Zombie. Not sure if this is a sequel or a spinoff, but it was good. Though I think White Zombie was better. And that's the end of this block of horror classics. When next we meet, it'll be Monsters, Fate, More Dead Men, and One Mad Monster. Stay tuned.